I'm Lisa Haysha. Welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have John Posey, who's been an actor for over 20 years. He's created and stars in a one-man show that he's toured the country. He's done hundreds of commercials. He's been around the block. He's He came out here, I believe, he'll fill me in, to be a star of a major TV show mm -hmm. and something happened. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about the highs and lows of success, fame, and just life and how to balance your personal life with career, success, and how fame could mess things up in between. So welcome, John. Thank you. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. It's so nice to have you here. And the, the, uh, the hot weather went away. It's a beautiful day in California. Mm -hmm. Which is, we're so spoiled and used to that <laughs> there was that one stretch of time that got a little yeah, out of control. That was beautiful today. How are yes. you? Yes. I'm very good. I'm excited to have you here because I know you have so much to share with the audience. You know, our mutual friend Matt told me so much about you and how inspiring you have been to him. So. Yes, I told, I met Matt in a workshop and uh, immediately came to my stories to how I got out here. Uh, everybody has a story. Um, Mine was, uh, I found out later that it happens often, but at the time it was, you know, it, it, it was hard to, to handle. I was doing comedy in Atlanta, Georgia with a group of, oh, I, I guess there were seven of us. And we thought we were very good. We thought we were going to replace Saturday Night Live. We, were, we had that kind of energy. We we're all in our 20s. And really doing fun work, very talented people. And we were getting some looks and we were getting some heat. And then one day somebody from ABC uh, had come to see the show. I didn't know they were there. And they pulled me aside and said, hey, we, we love your energy, your look and everything. How would you like to fly to New York and talk to our developmental people about uh, finding a series for you? We think you're perfect for a number of things. And I thought, hmm, you know, Atlanta's a hard town to leave. It's a beautiful city. Had good friends, had a lot going on. And as an actor, there was a lot going on there, whether it's theater or the TV or film that's coming through town and some of the lesser things that are available to an actor there, but we all... We all loved it, and so I had to give it some thought, but I, I went ahead, and what I did was I, I wrote a quick four-minute monologue, because I was sure that people in New York had seen every monologue ever, ever, ever performed, and I thought, well, I can't do that, so I have to come up with something original, which I did. Went there. It was a huge success, and they immediately uh, assigned me, as they said they would, and put me on a TV show, which happened almost immediately thereafter. And I thought, wow, that was too and easy. And how old were you at the time? 30. Okay. So I was a little late getting out here. You know, a lot of actors get out here when they're 20, 21, mm -hmm. maybe younger. Uh, and I have a story there, too. Um, but um, so I was 30. And like I said, it's kind of enjoying where I was. And you know, a lot of actors do very well and, and, and stay in those communities. Or New York or San Francisco or Chicago or places like that. So I don't know if I was dying to get it, but once it became available to me, I thought, this is fantastic. And I did go shoot this pilot for a TV show. And they, it was going to be a huge part of this Friday night lineup that ABC had. Did you want to, did I tell you what the show was? No. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, everything was great. And I went back to Atlanta to pull my stuff out in a trailer and halfway across the country got a phone call that I was no longer in the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> that I was replaced by somebody else, and I it took me a long time to uh, sort of get the answers. But it had nothing to do with me. It never, it really doesn't. It, it's always sort of relationships. Somebody had somebody else in mind. He was unavailable. He became available, and and so that was it. And um, do you want to reveal what show that was? Yeah, it was Full House. Okay. I was the original dad on Full House, mm. and that wasn't what I really came out to do. I, it, that wasn't the kind of comedy I was doing, but it was something that was offered to me. I was 30, I was young, it was exciting, and big hit on ABC, and again, it had nothing to do with my work or anybody else's. Yes. It was just one of those things that happened, but it did leave me kind of spinning, saying, what just happened? One day I'm minding my own business with a group of seven close friends, and we're doing great original comedy that included music and dance and improv and everything, just having a great time. We were starting to get some notices. Um, this is back in Atlanta where, when the Jeff Foxworthy was there and those kinds of guys. Mm -hmm. We were all friends and, and, and trying to make our name. And so I was literally about to go back to Atlanta. I said, I'm never, I'm, I'm leaving LA, I'm never coming back. But uh, 
an, an agent pulled me aside and said, don't, don't, just go to New York, take some time off. I'm going to put you in my commercial division up there where you can shoot a few commercials and then kind of figure out what you want to do. And so I went there and those few commercials turned into dozens and dozens. I, I didn't know you could make a living doing that. <laughs> Apparently you can. Yeah. So, so for some reason, I guess I was the Procter and Gamble guy or something like that. I looked at the guy next door, so I just got job after job. But while I was there, I took what essentially was this little monologue that I had done for the people at ABC that they loved so much. And I kept looking at it saying, there's a story here. And it was a father and son story that when I first wrote it, I wasn't sure what I had, but I kept looking at it. And it became, while I was in New York trying to clear my head of what just happened, I wrote what became a long-running, successful one-man show called Father, Son, and Holy Coach. And it was a father-son story where the father had thought that his life was somewhat of a failure. and He was going to relive his life vicariously through his son, whether his son wanted to participate in that mm -hmm. or not. Having said that, it was told largely through very broad comedy until it wasn't, until there was some pathos involved. And it was essentially, my dad was kind of that guy who thought he had a failed life, even though he didn't. He just passed away this year, and I couldn't believe the outpouring of... of um, <clears throat> he was a teacher in high school of all his previous students who came to tell me what a great teacher he was and how he changed their life. And I thought, gee, I don't think he knew that, <laughs> mm. because we used to have these conversations. And that led me to write this thing. And while I was in New York, recovering from my firing, and uh, for a good two and a half years... And how did you recover? Uh, I will. I, I, New York, New York City is a wonderful place to be if you're if you're an actor. Okay. It's a little more of an of a, a, a accepting community if you're an artist. You know there are obviously many artists and, and writers and, and artistic people out here, but it's a little more of a company town. It's not quite as as a, a little less relenting than in New York, where people would come and watch you do a play in your bathroom if mm. you invited them. It was a whole different atmosphere. So you recovered through doing work and just yeah, jumping it was into other projects. Finding out that I, I could do this, mm -hmm. my day job was actually shooting commercials. I wasn't even reading for, 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 for theater or anything else because I'd I become so ensconced in this one-man show that I thought, mm -hmm. I've got something here. The stuff just kept flowing out. I would sit in these little Greek diners at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock morning with the summer rain coming down. I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Florida and Georgia, so I, I appreciate the weather that comes in. And I wrote this thing. And... Uh, as soon as I staged it, um, I got this enormous response from it. And I thought what I was doing was creating something to draw attention to myself as an actor. And it turned out I was more concerned with what people were saying about the certain passages and what I had written. So obviously I found out by accident that I'm a writer. Mm. And I encourage all actors, all actors should be writing. Oh, absolutely. They just have a great ear for dialogue, yes. and every actor should be writing. And I kind of, even though in, in college I studied, it was more like advertising writing. It was radio, TV, mm -hmm. copy, and things like that. I, I hadn't gotten into the screenplay work, but I found I had a natural skill, dialogue and voice, and, and how to balance pathos and comedy. And I, I, I got into this thing, and I brought it back to um, L.A. and... Uh, 1990, decided to stage it. I had staged pieces of it in New York and I felt it was finally ready. It wasn't. It, it, it kept developing for years and years. But when I finally put it up, not only did I get a, an enormous response and great reviews from people that you wouldn't think you'd get re great reviews from, but sure enough, a studio came and wanted to snatch the rights up right away. And that wasn't why I wrote it. <laughs> mm. And I thought, I, I, I don't see it as a film, but okay. And uh, so from that, things started to pop, and all of a sudden I had this, this piece. And uh, I did tour the country with it for almost 12 years. I got into a, uh, with a booking agency out of New York, took this on the road, and it was just a wonderful experience. I eventually stopped because my kids needed me at home. I had two little guys. So back up a little bit. If, first of all, how did you get into acting? When did you get married and have kids during all of this? Oh, yeah, yeah. And how did you have time to do that? I wasn't studying. You know, I discovered a, a lot of people come out here and they have their degrees in theater. It never occurred to me to do that. I was at the University of Florida studying uh, the journalism mm -hmm. broadcasting. Mm -hmm. I thought I might want to go into the sports world, but I, I found myself bored when I got closer to what actually you would be doing. This is before ESPN came along. And I thought, I don't want to do that. And I sort of 
I found myself with these improv groups on weekends, making 10 bucks a night, and I thought, this is a lot of fun. And while I got my degree in advertising and journalism, I quickly found myself on the other side. I had no theater training before I got here. What I, I went right from a guy who was from the advertising school doing improv comedy into bigger improv comedy into bigger improv comedy, and then finding that I was pretty good in front of a camera. It's one of those things where I turned the camera and it never, I thought this is very natural and it all worked out great. So I was booking everything in Atlanta, which is why it was hard to leave. Mm. I was having, but without any great formal training. So when I went to New York, I finally began to get more of the formal training. So the craft started to make a lot more sense to me, which is another reason New York turned out to be a great three year run. Then when I got back here, it was shortly after I got back here that I got married to a, a woman who's not in the business. She eventually had to become, because we'll have a kid who got in the business, and I'll tell you about that. <clears throat> so she became an expert in the business, but she wasn't. But um, What was she doing at the time? She was working as a kinesiologist. I got hurt playing a softball game, and when I met her, I was doubled over because I couldn't stand up straight. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so I went to a doctor who sent me to her, and... Uh, we got married shortly thereafter and are still married, 20th, just celebrated our 23rd anniversary. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I put this piece up just before my first son was born uh, in, in, in uh, L.A. And again, it was a, it was a, a big hit. And also it was funny because the casting community thought I was a New York actor, even though <laughs> you know, I, was, I was from Georgia. Spent for years in New York, and suddenly I became this, hey, mm -hmm. this guy's good, he's trained in New York. Oh, okay. Uh, but I became, an, and, and now here's what happened to the play. Immediately, I was uh, approached by a studio who wanted the rights to it, and I said, well, I can't turn it down. But it put me in a very scary situation. I said, we want you to write the screenplay to your own play. And the play was a series of uh, non-connected events that I connected through certain devices, which you can do in theater, which doesn't work in screenplay. So I immediately became terrified of how, how am I going to do this because I'd never written a screenplay. I had written 30 second radio commercials and TV commercials as a college kid but I hadn't progressed beyond that. So I kind of had to learn on my feet. But again, as that happened, I found out that I had just sort of a natural affinity for voice and dialogue and how to, and how to structure a screenplay and uh, wrote a screenplay that they liked, but it never never got done. It was always bouncing around people coming and going. And I have since written nine, all of which have been optioned or purchased, and some are still out there. One actually finally got made a few years ago, and two are still in play, and I have another one. And it, it's been kind of like my acting world, um, the ups and downs of writing world, mm -hmm. where you think you have a deal someplace, and you're at the studio level, and you're meeting the, the top people at the studio level and something comes along and shuts it down that has nothing to do with the script. So I thought, this is kind of like acting. Mm. <laughs> the, same, the same ups and downs, although you put a little more into the writing. You might put nine months into a piece and someone will go, oh, it turns out someone else is doing a similar story. Or, or um, Disney once hired me to write a great biopic on, uh, on Eddie the Eagle, the famous or the infamous British ski jumper. I was six months into it, and everybody was really happy when we found out somebody else actually had this guy's rights, and he didn't know it. Mm. He had sold them because he didn't have legal counsel. So it went away, and to this day, it's probably the best thing I've ever written. It'll never get made, I don't think, because of the legal. Because so many people have that issue here. <laughs> and just with the studio folds, I once wrote a script and sold it to a studio, and it folded. Yeah. And I said three producers are attached. If I wanted it back, I'd have to pay three times the price. Oh, it's crazy. And like, <laughs> yeah, and, and I just thought, want my idea back. You just want your idea yeah. back. And I've, I've been down the road with this, and it's been, uh, uh, or, or when you go in for a writing assignment, yes. where they say one of four of you are going to end up writing this. Go give us your best pitch, and I'll go away and put up 40 pages. Yes. So when they say no, it's like a dagger in my heart. Mm. It's okay if they say no as an actor. Yes. Someone could say, we liked you, but this guy's taller. We're going to go with him. I can buy that. But as a writer, I, put, I find out, like, when the play got the big reviews, it, I suddenly did not care what they said about the actor because I knew I, could, I was playing 22 different mm -hmm. roles on stage, two of whom were women. One was a dog and the rest were on this, this entire town. <laughs> I'd love to see that. And it, it, it's really wonderful, but I was, if somebody mm -hmm. said, made any comment about a passage that didn't work, I'd go nuts trying to figure out what happened. Why didn't they like it? So obviously, 
I sort of shifted to that direction. Never stopped acting. I mean, but I how did you deal with the highs and lows and the rejection? And I think that first, <clears throat> that first rejection, <clears throat> for some reason, I think when I came out here, I had no uh, no mentors before I got here. But before I left, somebody said, "Find a mentor as soon as you get there." I think that's some of the best pieces of advice yeah. ever: is to find a mentor yeah. and really figure out what you want. As a writer and yeah. an actor, find a mentor, and, and I have one as a writer, and I and I have one as an actor. And I think when I got at her, I didn't know what to expect. Probably what the reason I was able to pull through this casually without pulling out my hair is that I was kind of naive to the whole thing mm -hmm. and didn't know what to expect. I thought, well, this must happen a lot, and it does. I mean, but that's a huge loss when you are taken off a show that of course. still airs 25 years yes. later. I mean, you're talking about having the biggest house on a hill versus... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, so, and that's something, fortunately, I had to completely get out of my mind. I've had my kids sometimes. My, I have a funny story. I have two kids. My youngest one, my oldest one's an actor. My youngest one's not. My youngest one never knew I was in Full House until I told him it because he kept watching it because the reruns kept playing. And I said, you know, I did it, the pilot of that. And he didn't believe me. I showed it to him. And I think he was disturbed by it. Because the guy that ended up with the role, and I, physically, we couldn't be more mismatched, the two guys. And, uh, and so he just thought it was very odd. But he said, uh, he said it's good you didn't get it because I wouldn't be here if you did. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, probably true. Well, I'm sure it's probably true. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I try not to think about it. It's come up a few times. I've gotten calls when they do the anniversaries of the show and people find out that somebody else had actually shot the pilot. And I'm sure that's happened to a number of actors where mm -hmm. they called them and say, we hear you were the original choice for Bonnie and Clyde or for something Disney that never happened. How do you feel? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, what can you say? You just have to, if, just if, if you dwelled is. on it, you'd never get, you'd never do it again. So you, you just keep going to the next one. And I think what happened for me was I, I said, I've got to diversify because I love what's going on. I found out by accident I'm a writer. I found out by accident... I can do improv comedy. And then this whole commercial thing happened. And then the voiceover world came to me. Well, if and you could do one thing over, if you could put yourself back at 18 years old, what would you do differently? Well, I think I might have... Here, here's the mistake I made. I came out here, yes, I, it, I was important to find a mentor, but I didn't have the groups that a lot of mm -hmm. people have when they come out here. I might have gone to a school like a Carnegie Mellon or a, Mel or a Northwestern or an NYU where you would have been in a group with a lot of people who came out here, mm -hmm. who come out here continuously and are successful. University of Florida where I went didn't have a film or a theater school. I came from the journalism school and I just, you know, although there's a couple of us who... So you didn't have a community. I didn't a have a community. Yeah. And I didn't really know where to find that community. I'd, I'd get into some acting workshops where there were some good actors and writers doing some good things, and I began to reach out. But I didn't have it when I got here. And I think if I had done it over again, I can see why you would go to a, you know, get a master's in Yale drama or any of the East Coast schools that, that do so well. And I, uh, so getting a late start, I think I, I was at a bit of a disadvantage from not having that. I mean, I... I could have, cause some of the people who come out here and do really, really well might do so with a stand-up comedy or something like that, which I didn't have. Okay. Uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, when I did this, when I did this one-man show, I think I had a tremendous fear of comedy clubs because I didn't know how I, to deal with hecklers. So I thought, I'm going to take my comedy to a theater where people don't do that. <laughs> and that's why I did that. Mm -hmm. That's why I went this whole theater route. But there were other actors doing the same thing, these one-man shows at the same time and becoming quite successful at doing them, some of which were turned into films. So what would you do differently? Would you take the chance I, and go I, into different venues? I think I would have. I think not, I don't know about comedy. Do you comedy. think fear held you back a yeah, little bit? Yeah, fear, okay. fear of being in a, in a, and chances are pretty good that I would have done fine that route because uh, I did a lot of physical comedy mm -hmm. and I got, this play got huge laughs for 90 minutes. People falling out of their chair laughs, but I, for some reason, was much more comfortable in a theater. The downside of that is that you kind of have to produce your own thing, and it may or may not be a hit. Uh, it's not like you can just uh, you go to these comedy clubs where they put up the money. Right, you just do right. your 15 minutes and go home. This was different. This was me buying out the theater and producing it and hiring PR people. But 
I performed this show in front of as many as 900 people mm -hmm. a night all over the country. <clears throat> and a um, little disappointed that it didn't become a film. It bounced around for years. And I just think it kind of required the, the right people to be in place. Absolutely. To Even if it's the best thing, it's yeah. the right people have to come. It's the like right magic. It's yeah. <laughs> and so when these things do get made, it is the right people. And, I, and, I, and I've seen it done. The one I did get made, it came together simply because a good friend of mine always knew this story and called me and said, hey, I'm running the studio right now. We're going to make your movie mm. before something changes. And it happened. <laughs> okay, so, so again, connections, so community. Got, yeah. Yeah. So, there was the, so that's, it's the community that I didn't. I, I was coming out here as kind of like that lone guy. I'm going to do it myself. So what advice would you give to an actor or anyone who wants to pursue their dreams and move to a different place? And what advice do you give to your son? Well, my son, I told him, I have a son who has a, uh, the lead in his own TV series. He's 23, he turned 23 last week. He'd been working as an actor since he was seven, film and TV, mm -hmm. overseas, here, everywhere, and he's done very well. I had a couple of years where he didn't, but I, what I told him was that be very, very humble because while you may be successful now, there's a lot of ups and downs, people moving up the ladders, coming down the ladders. Be humble, be collaborative. Uh, and he's bought that lock, stock, and barrel. I, and the network consistently talks about what a great ambassador he is for his TV show. Mm. And, and um, uh, he, he constantly steps out to, to promote the show uh, over and above what he, what he needs to do, uh, over and above the calling. And he just does a, does a great job and seems to really love life and love the business. But I, I think any actor, I think, hook up and, and, and get with kids who are making things happen, because there's always a generation of people coming up. Try not to do it alone. If you didn't have the advantage of coming from one of the great film or, or theater schools, find them when you get it, because there are some great workshops out mm -hmm. there, people doing great things, and just get with them, because one will bounce off and become a writer, one will become a showrunner, one will become a producer, and some will become actors of success, and, and stay and keep growing. And, uh, that was my mistake, I think, was just sort of trying to be the lone ranger. But I did learn to diversify. So I would tell any actor, explore the voiceover world. Explore what's, you know, what I didn't have when I came out here is the YouTube world where you can create your own. You don't have to go on stage and create a one-man show. You can do it on YouTube nowadays and get the same response. Um, understand the commercial world. Understand uh, the industrial film world. Understand that you can write. Understand that you don't. If you if you're trying to get noticed, if you don't have the money to do a five or a ten minute movie, put up a one man show. Um, how does that um, how does that advice lend itself to any career? If you were to advise any you know high school student, college student about their future, what advice would you have for well, them? Well, I think if you get locked into just one thing and you're not able to diversify or look at all the possibilities um, uh, because the world is changing mm -hmm. so quickly. I'm a, a little fear of my youngest son who's in college now and he hasn't quite found it. And he, he's not a kid who wants to get into computer programming which is what everybody says if you want to make money right. get into computer. That's not where he's wired. He's not wired that way. So I keep asking do you want to be in this business? Do you want to be in that business? I'll throw out so many potential ideas just to give him the I just the, the notion of divert take your idea and move it this direction and move it that direction. Uh, there's n nobody can tell you that you can't have variations on a certain theme of where you think you're headed. Um, it, it's the same idea as you know if you believe it, you can do it. When I came out here, I think part of it might have been naivete that I maybe had I known how many people were competing for the same job I was after. I might have gone. I might have gone. Jeez, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I don't stand a chance. But I didn't pay any. I never paid attention to that. And somehow I've succeeded. I'm, I've been out here thirty years and still banging around and still having fun and still working as an actor and as a writer. So how do you keep your marriage together in a career like this? You said you've been married yeah. over twenty years. Yes, my wife was not in the business. <clears throat> uh, our first son became an actor early on at the age of seven, so she was forced to learn the business to protect him because you know you have kid actors mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who try to take advantage of your time. So did she quit her job and become? Yeah, she did. She did. Uh, she got out of the medical profession and became a stage mom uh, for uh, about ten, eleven years until he was on his own. So she learned a lot about the business. She worked on a number of studio films that, that he did. So she had to learn quickly. 
um, uh, and did a great job. And from that, I actually wanted to write, and she and I had written the script together. So, mm. so um, it, also, I th you know, we got married a little bit late. I was thirty-seven when I got married. I'm fifty-nine now, mm. and um, and she was a few years younger than me. So I think I sort of sort of figured out what I did and who I was looking for and who I wasn't looking for. She wasn't in the business. Um, and were you looking for that? Someone outside the business? I think so. Yes. I think so. Because we all, if we're all in the business, you end up dating people in the business. And it's it, while it's very dramatic and fun on stage, it's not so interesting. Right, <laughs> off stage. <laughs> off stage. So I thought, you and know. Both I, people traveling yeah, all the time. And I thought, and this is a terrible and... place to meet somebody. And sure enough, I was playing softball one day for in, in, in the entertainment league. Took a swing, my back went out. Someone sent me to a doctor who sent me to her. And that's how I met her. Mm. So that part worked out fine. But I, I think I'm. I sort of, at that point, I, being 37, I think she sort of know what she wants. And, and so I was fortunate to meet her. She was the same sort of soul as me, just sort of a very laid back, free spirited person. And our, and our kids are like that. Um, and my oldest boy, the one who's the actor, got quite a bit of her personality. He'll walk into a room and it's like the lights went on. And mm. that's something she's always the center of the party. So so he's learned from both of us, and she used to be on the set. And she. Because there would be kids on the set that would be uh, doing that kid thing. Hey, I'm a kid. Go get me a drink. You're a PA. That kind mm -hmm. of thing. And she'd say, if you ever do that, if I ever <laughs> do that, it'd be the last show you ever do. So he learned that everybody, treat everybody with respect. And it's just, and then for me, I think he got, anything can happen. You know, study, work hard. Things happen. This is a weird business. Just treat people well and they'll want to come back and work with you. So he, and I hear that a lot. People will write about my son. They'll say, he's just such a, grounded kid and I said yeah he didn't really come from that part of the industry where it's kind of nuts does he have a community of actors that he works with or you know does he take after you kind of being the Lone Ranger well he he hasn't yet it, the funny thing is he started when he was the age of seven so he doesn't have any real formal training like you would think mm -hmm. um, he came on stage with me what got him interested in the business I was doing this one-man show and he'd sit in this in the seats and watch me at the age of five, he asked if he could come on stage with me. And I had a moment in the play, and I thought, wow, if, I brought, if I'm on stage by myself for 80 minutes, and at the very end, the lights go down, come back up, and there's a kid sitting, it's going to shock the audience. And it worked out really well. So he did. He would sit in the audience the entire time, watch the entire play. I could see him in the front row. And the lights would pop down toward the end, and he'd sneak around back. The lights would come back up. He'd be sitting on stage with me. It was a fascinating moment. I could tell that this was going to be his world. And so uh, I began to tell him right away, okay, this is what you need to expect. This is what this world's about. But he doesn't have, he didn't have, that's the only theater he's done. Otherwise, he got into doing TV series for four years in Canada and these movies and movies and movies and TV and TV. He has no formal training. When he hit about 16, I said, you know, now that you're an adult actor, the directors are expecting you to bring the goods. When you're a kid actor, you just take direction really well. And if you take direction well, you're going to have a good career as a kid. The reason most kids don't transition mm -hmm. into adult actors is because of suddenly they have to bring the goods. Some do, some don't. Um, so I p put him into different workshops with people where he's remained friends mm -hmm. with a great number of actors. And in his series, a lot of actors have come and gone. This is a series called Teen Wolf, which is a big hit on MTV. And they, they bring a lot of young kids in to do the supporting role, so he's got a big community of those kids. But he still doesn't have the time. Does he have to wear hair, get hair and makeup done oh, every yeah. day? Look like not that? every day. When they go through, when they transition into these werewolves, mm -hmm. which he does, they have long days on the set, 15, 16 hour days of makeup. Some of it's CGI. The eyes no longer require him to put in uh, fake contacts, which is killing him. It's all done in post which he's happy about. So his brother never got the bug, seeing his brother, dad and his, his mom. His brother is his... a college baseball player, uh, a sophomore. Never got the bug. I, I, his, my son's agents and manager would call and say, when's the other kid coming in? I said, you can have him. I don't think he's interested. And he'd say, yeah, maybe I'll do it. he go, I don't really want to. So I, and at 19, I still say, people are calling. They're asking if you want to get started. I mean, I do have an entree. No, I don't think so. So I usually, you stop after that. 
Yeah. At, at some point, they have to want it. Oh, they have to really want it. You don't want, want it. it. You're not going to make it, and yeah. you're going to waste yeah. your time and just be filled with rejection, rejection, oh, rejection. As a father of an actor, I can tell you that <clears> that's 150% true. If, if you're trying to push a kid into this business, it, it'll have horrible results. And I've seen it a lot. I saw it in New York and here where obviously the parents were more interested than the children were, and, and that was bad. But um, this kid, I, I, I said, how about cinematography? How about uh, how about editing? How about you know? You can sh I can give you five directors. You can shadow right now. Are you interested? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you are, whatever <laughs> you, well, you know. Uh, otherwise, you know, he's a baseball player, so he, uh, kinesiology maybe, mm -hmm. like your mom did. No, nah, I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> we'll find out. Something will hit. Mm -hmm. And he's not. He just turned twenty yesterday. So at twenty and twenty three. So the first kid knew what he wanted from a young age, even though he's had moments where he thought, geez, I don't think I want to act anymore. And, and that's why studios don't work with 17-year-old actors, because they don't have to. They, they get the 18-year-old to play the 17-year-old kid. Yes, kids, exactly. Because 17-year-old kids are unruly and won't behave. I have a 26-year-old friend who's playing 16 yeah. in a show. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that's why they, 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 looks... they say from 15 to 18, mm -hmm. this kid's not going to work because mm -hmm. nobody cares. They don't want to deal with parents, they don't want to deal with teachers, mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with welfare. We're going to look for an 18-year-old to play 15. So it was about that time that he started really thinking, okay, I'm, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm cool, I'm going, to, I'm going to start studying. So he got him into workshops so he understood what was going on. And he's doing fine. I think he's going to have a great career. He's a but good yeah, going back to you a little bit, if you've had a great career, you're very lucky. You've worked a lot, you've done so many commercials, you've done your own show. People would dream to be able to write a one-person show, man or woman, and perform it all over the country and get great reviews. You're happily married. You have two kids. They seem to be doing well. So really, you have it all. You really have the American dream. So what I want to talk about a little bit is when it's nighttime and you're in bed by yourself or with your wife asleep by your side, when your demons start coming out, what do those demons say and what advice do you have for other people who are going through something of maybe I'm not good enough or I could have had that, I could have done this? I do say that. I mean, uh, All of us do. Yeah, all of me all wishes of I had gotten to a higher, a higher level. I think I thought when I came out here, I wasn't sure what to think, but at some point you go, why can't I have those roles? I want to be on that set with those guys. And I've been there before. I've done a ton of TV and a to a lesser degree, some film, but I've been in the room with some of the greatest uh, actors in the industry, and it's kind of brief. You know, one day I'm working with Tom Hanks, the next day I'm doing a Church's Fried Chicken commercial. Mm -hmm. That's a weird world. It is. <laughs> it is. And that's that's absolutely true, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, wow. I mean, the the the. Um, what did you do with Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks uh, produced and directed a, 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 a miniseries for HBO called From the Earth to the Moon mm -hmm. be, before he did A Band of Brothers. Okay. Uh, this was about the Apollo astronauts, and I played one of the Apollo astronauts. There were many of us, and we were in Florida together for almost nine months, off and on, all of us. And it was the greatest experience I've ever had in the business, and I thought, God, I wish it could be like this every day. Um, Tom directing and other directors and writers coming in to do their segments and working with great guys with great energy, doing great material. And, you know, only a few of us, for one reason or another, get to achieve that and stay at that level. And I think what you have to really do is try to be grateful for what you have. So many people out here, uh, going back to that conversation about why, how did I get my energy back, it was something about the energy of New York. Out here, sometimes it's a little harder of a struggle because everybody's clawing to try to get to the top. But if you can sort of, sort of be grateful for the areas that you do have. I mean, I've been fortunate to be a, a TV actor, a stage actor, a voiceover commercial, um, and, and a writer. And I, uh, if when one doesn't work, suddenly something else opens up, or that one shuts, and I'll go over here, and there's an opening there, and it's just what keeps me busy. So I think you've got to try not to be angry and spend too much time on what didn't happen versus what what is happening right now. I mean, I oh, to this day, I still think, and I'm, I'll be 60 not too long in the future, and uh, I, I still think there's a series out there for me. Uh, I, I've got, uh, I've written a screenplay that Tyler and I are hoping, my son, that's his name, Tyler Posey, um, are hoping to produce together that he wants, that I wisely wrote the <laughs> lead role with mm -hmm. him in mind. And so um, I've always, I'm always thinking, 
positively that this stuff's right around the corner. It's going to happen. Keep plowing away at it. But while you're satisfied with what you've done, right? You're not, because I think one of the big mistakes most people do is live in the future. Oh, it's right there. I'm going to get it. It's right there instead of going, I'm there. And if I get that, that's an added bonus. You know uh, what I mean? Can you explain a little bit of the difference? Yeah, and- I've learned that I've, I've had to do that. I mean, if you don't show some gratitude for something that could be, uh, what's, what's the low end here? It could yeah. be a... It could be an industrial film, which is something that doesn't even air. It's you're, you're doing a, something for Walmart or a Home Depot, a demonstration of a tool, and you go, well, that wasn't really rewarding. But then you go, well, wait a minute. You know, it's all part of what we do, and probably all of us started there, and I'll still go back to that. But what I've learned is that I never say no to anything. And while I hope that there's opportunities in the future... Um, you have to look at every every level that's available to you, and 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 be grateful that 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 came your way, even if it's a little tiny piece of theater and there's five people in the seats, which is I've been down that road before because mm-hmm. it's part of it. And I think as an actor, they say be careful about playing for the result. Even when you're in the room, you're auditioning. Don't play for the result. What's the result? To get the job. No, exactly. you never do that. You play, you have two minutes. Everybody in business complains so much about the audition process because it's not easy. I mean, it's a weird deal. Yes, yeah, so you have to be in the moment, love what you're yeah. doing, and not want it for any other reason except for you love what you're doing. Yeah, and you get and, two minutes to show that, to yes. show your thing. There could be 10 people staring at you, and it could be awkward. It's as awkward for them as it is for you. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to shake hands. They want to go high. They want to get you. They're hoping you're the exactly. guy that comes in. And that's what they want. That's yeah. important. They want you to succeed. They want you to be the guy. Yeah. Because... They, they do, and if you know that, if you go in knowing that, it takes a lot of the fear out of exactly. it. Exactly. So you have to, just, everything has to be, whether you're acting or anything else, in the moment, right then and there. If you start thinking about the result, geez, if I get this, I'll get this, then I can meet this guy over here and I can build that addition to my house. That kills everything. So it's all about one little moment at a time of what you're being given the opportunity to do. If it's a little theater piece or, or if you have written a piece, and you don't know whether somebody's going to buy it, but if you're writing it, you're writing yes. it for you. You have no idea whether anything's going to sell or not. But there's joy just in the process of writing. I'm, I, so, I what do you want your legacy to be? Well, maybe I'm the guy that uh, I'm the guy that I'm the guy they couldn't fire. Mm. You know, you know, I came in here, lost something big, and then, uh, uh, well, depends on how you look at it. Um, but I think I have a much broader horizon as a result of that I don't think it had that had that show had gone with me and I don't think I ever would have put pen to paper and written the stuff I've written and I have a nice body of work not all of it's been made but it's all sold and it's all out there and it's in and, and, and I've learned that I have a, a a voice and people are interested in reading people are interested in in in, in, in buying what I wrote even though that's not why well initially that's not why I wrote it but I still continue to write as an act, as a writer, you have to do the same. You have to write for yourself something that you want to watch. So, uh, the stuff I write is a little harder to sell nowadays. You know, <laughs> for what you want. <laughs> yeah, for what I want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, people are they're, they're, the studios are making different movies than what I'm writing. So you have to pull together a group of yes. people that have passion that they can put the money to something. But uh, it's all about uh, you know, stop saying tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. You can do it right now. Eventually, these things come back and people find them. Yes. Just keep building the body of work that you do at no matter what level it is. Mm-hmm. So and for your legacy, what would you want it to be that you built this body of work? I built, well, I built a body of work mm-hmm. and, and the, uh, 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 Posey Part 2 to come in behind me. I gave him the tools yes. to understand. So, And that's something that I'm, I'm proud of that I was able to, you know, some people would say, you let your kid be an actor? Are you nuts? And I said, well, no, he gravitated to it, but I gave him the tools to do it the right way. And so that would be my legacy and that and the fact that I came to a town knowing nobody and had a kind of a false start that I was able to bounce back. I feel like I'm that guy in baseball that keeps being invited up to the majors. <laughs> and, and then they send him back down and eventually yes. he finally gets back yes. up and he, he just stayed with it. So, um, 
No, I'm looking so forward to seeing everything you do in the future, and I know there's a huge part two in your life right now. Well, Tyler has actually expressed doing this one-man show as a two-man show, which would be interesting. That he would, would be great. He would play the younger roles, and it is a father-son story, mm -hmm. although it's my father and me. Uh, and if uh, once his show goes to hiatus, or maybe they're done wrapping permanently, I think we may just do that. Well, I look forward to that. that yeah, that's something I think we'll do in the next year or so. Thank you so much, Thank John. you. Appreciate this it. This is fun. Thanks.